All right, so I think, uh, I think it's 3.15, we'll get started. Um, hi everyone, my name is Michael Edenson, uh, co-founder and CEO of Fianu Labs. I know uh, some of you uh, probably came here to see Andres Vega. Uh, he, unfortunately, he was unable to make it at the last minute, so, uh, so I'll be sharing some of his thoughts as well. Um, Andres uh, is with uh, Control Plane, which is a professional services firm that's doing a lot of solutioning around automated governance. And at Fiano, we would build products to solution automated governance as well. So uh, Andres and I have been working pretty closely over the last two years, developing some solutions in this area. And we wanted to share with you uh, some of the things that we found, some of the things that we're working on, uh, and some of the lessons learned. So my agenda for today, I'm going to give a little bit of background and context what we're talking about with automated governance, a few definitions. We're going to talk about attestations, then open source tools, uh, example architecture, and demo some art of the possible before uh, talking about where to go from here. So for a little bit of background, um, it, a lot of this conversation around automated governance began with a white paper that was written in 2019, uh, which was the DevOps Automated Governance Reference Architecture. That was developed uh, by a, a group of individuals uh, as part of the IT revolution think tank uh, from the banking industry, uh, heavily, heavily represented. And that architecture was taken and put into practice as some of the nation's largest banks. Um, the result of, of those implementations led to the book uh, Automated, uh, sorry, Investments Unlimited, uh, which details a fictional bank's journey toward automated governance and how to, how to resolve some of the issues that can arise, like MRIAs. And the nature of this is that building software is complex. We all know that. And at a regulated institution, that's amplified. Uh, you have a bunch of different runtimes, a bunch of different build platforms, tool chains, uh, release environments, and being able to capture all of the requisite metadata uh, sufficient for, for a software change can be, can be pretty tricky. And so when we talk about automated governance in this presentation, I'm going to talk about this specific part, the, the path to release. Um, and for those of you that are, that are at financial institutions, this may look familiar to you. You know, everything from creating a user story to writing the code to executing your tool chain uh, and then creating your change requests, doing your validation C tasks after. Um, and then providing the traceability of all of those events when the auditors come calling. So what is automated governance? And the definition that we'll be working off of today is that automated governance is the machine orchestrated capture and verification of SDLC event metadata, immutable storage of evidence, and automation, uh, 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 and automation of the authorization of the release based on predefined policy definitions. So we talk about predefined policy. We're talking about transparent policy that's evident, uh, evident to the developer. They can see what's required of them and what they need to do to meet it. Um, it's contractual, which means that it's been agreed upon that if you meet these certain policy requirements, then you can go release the software. Um, it's version controlled, so its history can be, can be shown uh, retroactively. And then you get bonus points if you store it in source code. Depends on how you want to implement it. Um, the second piece is telemetry. So the machine-led capture of all the event metadata around your SDLC, meaning that there's no uh, human reporting. Uh, you have a software that's able to capture and independently verify the authenticity of events happening. And the definition uh, of an event not occurring is that the machine couldn't capture it. We can talk more about that in a little bit. Um, also having clear definitions of the system of record and resource URIs. So although your automated governance software may not be the system of record for a lot of the evidence, it has uh, a, a resource URIs that can point to them uh, at the time of audit. Um, and then the ability to reproduce that, that chain of events at any given time to, to show the results. The last piece uh, is the, the tamper evident data store. So, uh, digitally signing your attestation so they can immutably be stored in, in, a, in a database and that come time of deployment when it's time to access these attestations, if the signatures don't match, you know that it's untrusted. And that, that pr protects against uh, 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 tampering with the evidence. And then the last piece is the automated enforcement, which is taking the subjective portion of authorization at the time of release and making that completely objective. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about today revolves around attestations. And so I, I thought I'd dive in a little bit of, uh, as to the anatomy of the attestations that we're talking about. So the, the attestation declares what event occurred. It identifies the asset in question. Uh, it timestamps with context so you know what happened uh, and when. Um, so that could be that an event, uh, you know, the, that a, a code scan began, a code scan completed. Um, all of those different uh, types of context around the event. Um, 
and then describing the conditions surrounding the event. So how did that happen? How did that come to be? What were the environment variables when that, that, that event occurred? Details of the output of the, of the event. So if you're running uh, a SAS scan, it would, be, it would be the vulnerability report. Um, comparing the results to the policy, so determining pass or fail or whatever the compliance state is, and then enough information to reproduce that event. So all of those different pieces being stored in each attestation um, is sort of the threshold that we're talking about for automated governance in order to, to get to that point of confidence where you can make these automated decisions. And so there are a lot of open source tools that can help you in this process, and some of them will, will show what you can make with them in a little bit. Um, but, but some of the most important ones are SigStore, uh, which is a digital signing tool, um, and we'll show you a little bit how we're using it. Um, also, Intoto and Salsa, uh, the ability to prove the authenticity uh, of the artifacts that you're capturing, um, as well as the, the, the environment that they were captured in, and then Open Policy Agent for being able to write your rule sets uh, to determine what the definition of, of passing and failing are. So in an example architecture, throughout the build and release process, you run all your different pipeline steps in your build pipeline. And you have your dev release pipeline where you, you, you deploy the code and you, you do some other types of testing. And then finally, your prod release pipeline. All of the raw event data being captured throughout the, that process, um, being stored uh, with context uh, in enrichment. So if you don't have all the information that you need from the raw event data, having the capability to go back and enrich it um, is very really important. Um, then determining pass or fail from the policy engine, uh, and then pr producing a signature and storing that in the immutable ledger before storing the attestation in its own database. So with an attestation API using this framework, uh, or this architecture, you can build some cool stuff. And that's really the next piece of this, which is continuous feedback. So uh, automated governance has a lot of really granular data, and that's sort of by, you know, by design, right? We're trying to, to take humans out of the governance of software development and so naturally, we're going to have to provide uh, a lot of evidence to suffice that. And so how do we make that and design that in a way that's user friendly, that encourages developers uh, to want to participate in this automated governance process? Uh, and as we say, make the right thing the easy thing. So we're kind of building up here to what, to what we're going to show. But an attestation example would be a combination of a few pieces. So on the left hand side, you see the control. And we're going to use an example to say unit test coverage. right? Um, and then on the right-hand side is the result. So for, for this attestation, this code base has 91% uh, code coverage with unit tests. So the, the policy piece is that predefined uh, policy that we, that we agreed upon that says you need to have 80% for this example. Then the raw event data, which captures the results of the, the unit test being executed in the pipeline, as well as all of the, the context around that. The rule that's written in Open's policy agent uh, that, that says if you're if your coverage is greater than or equal to the minimum. And then finally, the digital signature of the result of all of those pieces, so that when we come time to, to, to deploy, we can then look and say, all right, this matches the signature. We can trust that, that, that this data is authentic uh, and it's of the highest integrity. Um, and then that data can also be produced for auditors uh, at the end. So our approach at Fianu is, is to this is a simple shared language, so taking all of the governance and all of the compliance and breaking it down to, to five pieces. So that's pass, warn, fail, in progress, and not found. Um, and all these are pretty straightforward, except the one I want to talk uh, you know, a little bit about is the not found state. And that's really important in your automated governance journey. So as you, as you build these controls out and you, you provide this feedback to your developers, not found is going to be very useful to you because a lot of times, and I've seen this in practice, um, the, some of the bigger challenges for automated governance are that developers are doing things. They're doing uh, code scans. They're doing uh, testing. But they're not doing it in a way that's traceable. Um, and so being able to show them that, that this is not found, that we don't have any evidence of it, but it is required, is important because it'll help them uh, triage some of those issues of configuration. right? But adopting that posture of saying, uh, it's, not, it's, it's considered not found if the machine can't observe it independently is a really important step to, to getting everything in order. And so the demo that I want to show you uh, real quick is, is the art of the possible. Um, so at Fiano, we've been working on, uh, as I mentioned, on a product for, for automated governance. Um, and we want to show you, you know, what we're working on, hopefully to give you ideas of what you can be working on uh, with some of these pieces that are out there in the open source community. 
So with all of these tools, what can we build? And so here uh, we have a visualization of one service, right? Uh, so one code repository uh, in an organization. And you can see all of the past uh, versions of that code, all the past commits, uh, the, the environments that this version of the code is currently running in, as well as all of the controls and its current state of compliance. So for this example, this repository on this commit produced two artifacts, two Docker containers, user interface and an API, which means there are two attestations for container scan here. And we can click into each one of them and see, okay, the API is failing container scan. So we can go and look at the chain of events that led to that. We can look at the pipeline conditions that, uh, that were set at the time that the container scan was kicked off. This tells us that the container scan was provisioned from an authorized build, authorized build server, not someone's local machine. Then we have the enrichment callback that identifies the assets in question uh, and normalizes them uh, on the repository identifier. Um, and then finally, the attestation that produces pass or fail. And for each of these, we have the, the, the recore, six door recore ledger entry uh, that we can compare those signatures and, and, and prove that this data is authentic. So for a developer, they can go in here and say, okay, here are my vulnerabilities that I need to remediate. Um, and then it takes them to, to the system of record uh, so that they can, they can do so. And then it's all event driven. So as a developer builds their code, they rebuild their code, this updates in real time. And this is just uh, you know, a, a granular view of how a developer would interact on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think you can all probably extrapolate the, you know, this kind of data being captured on every single commit of the code base for all of the different control sets in your organization um, over time provides some, some pretty uh, big insights as to how, how your applications are, are performing. So the question is where to go from here. So assembling these open source tools and using these capabilities to build something that can provide traceability end to end from, from uh, code to production. You know, I'm gonna tell you a few stories from the trenches. In my, in my past role, I actually um, did a lot of work in this area at one of the, one of the top 10 largest banks in the country. Um, so some of these stories are from there and some of them are from, from others uh, that I've talked to in the time since. But a lot of it really revolves around, now we have all these details and what does that mean? And so what you do with all these details is kind of dependent on, on your organization, but some of the things that we've observed uh, to, to have worked and not worked are, are the following. Um, and the following is not to just dump the, 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 the details over to your regulators, right? Obviously they can be taken out of context. These are a lot of, it has a lot of granular informa information and it can be misused if it's not fully understood. Um, we know of an organization at one time that had a policy that said you must do unit tests. And so the risk department was looking through and saw that uh, one build didn't have unit tests because the developer commented it out. Um, and they were actually prepared to terminate that developer for uh, turning off the unit test. So that, they didn't fortunately, but it tells you that you know, this, this information is pretty powerful and sometimes if it's not fully understood, it can be used to create a culture that's not desirable. Um, and so, the alternative is to then abstract that data and create somewhat of a scorecard, right? So, you know, if really good, you're passing everything A, B, C, D, all the way to F. Um, and there are challenges to that as well, because one of the things that you want to achieve with automated governance is the federation of responsibility of compliance back to the developers. You want the developers to own their own compliance. Um, and so we found in practice that uh, if you abstract that evidence too much to the point where it becomes a simple uh, ABCD representation of their compliance, then it tends to go back to uh, the administrators who are then top down trying to, to obtain compliance. And that doesn't seem to be very effective in practice. What we found to be most effective um, in practice is automated enforcement. And so what that, what that means here in this example is, so you, you write your code, you build, you test, you deploy to dev, and if at any point in time, so you know, say for example, during your, during your code, like if you open a feature branch, um, we'll, we'll preview to you your current compliance, all right? Then during build and test, we'll alert you again to your, your given compliance. Then during your dev deploy and your promotion of the artifacts, we'll warn you and say, hey, not compliant on these, need to remediate. Uh, and then if you still go and attempt to, employ, to deploy to production, uh, that deployment will be blocked. Um, and so being able to do this in a fully automated fashion without any human intervention, um, I can tell you that when put into practice, it doesn't make everyone very happy. Um, but uh, I've seen that it has been very effective. Um, and when rolling this out 
in, in implementation, beginning with the easy controls, moving to the harder controls over time, the biggest challenge that you'll see is that it's a, it requires a huge change in behavior for developers. Um, they're having to use new muscles that they haven't before, um, and that is to, to really start to think about uh, compliance as every piece of their software development, right? But, but also not suffocating them to the point where you're breaking all of their CI builds if they're not compliant, right? You want developers to have that freedom to be able to build and test uh, and, and get things up there. Plus, in, you know, in, in a break-the-glass emergency, you don't want to, to be blocking them at the point where they need to be writing those new features and getting them out. So this is just an example model of how something like this can be rolled out. So breaking it down, when we talk about uh, this enforcement and, and some of the reasons why it works, uh, actually game theory helps to explain it. And that is that the optimal situation for a developer is that they can develop features in the wild, wild west. And the optimal feature for governance, uh, or the, sorry, the optimal environment for governance, risk, and compliance is that they have that 12-week evidence review before the change, right? Then the not optimal situation is vice versa, right? So developers, the the 12 week review is not optimal, and then for the uh, for the risk and compliance group, the wild wild west is obviously the, the the least optimal situation. So the subjective change process is the 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 way that things are currently being done, and that's optimal for both parties, but it's not really achieving the the, the objective of being able to to do continuous release. And so the not optimal uh, situation for both groups is automated governance. And that's that automated enforcement of all these policies, right? Um, the developers don't love it because it is uh, a pretty hard and fast requirement. If you're not compliant, your code won't deploy. Um, and then for the governance and risk and compliance, uh, they don't get to have their hands on this. They have to pre-agree ahead of time to all of the different evidence thresholds. Um, but this does provide the organization with, with the capability to, to, to improve the integrity of their compliance and deliver features faster. So some opportunities that this provides. Um, the ability to do different control templates, right? So being able to say, based on the product type or the risk posture, if it's internet facing, uh, if it's higher risk, if it affects the movement of funds, right? You have different sets of control requirements that can be applied. Um, and then you can, you can uh, even provide more context and say for a, a specific type of release, there's another set of controls that need to be applied. So um, you could say, for example, if you're only updating the base image, um, you may not need to do accessibility testing. Um, whereas if you are doing a change to business logic on the front end, then maybe you do, right? So you can provide these different types of releases in different contexts for each of your applications to say, these are the controls that need to be met, here's what you can do um, for this type of change. It also gives uh, the, the executives the ability for knobs and dials. So being able to turn up certain values in certain places. So you say, I want, you know, maybe 85% test coverage here on all new code, right? And then legacy code, maybe 55% uh, code coverage. Um, but then also being able to say, all right, you know, for a period of time, if you, if you have a legacy code base, you have, uh, you know, six months to remediate your higher critical vulnerabilities, at which point automatically now you'll be blocked uh, for any new, new higher critical vulnerabilities. So it gives you that, that granular level of control. Um, and it also allows you to shape developer behavior. So um, in one example, in past practice, we've observed uh, a large bank that wanted to upgrade their CD pipeline libraries, right? And so in the past, that typically would have been a process that would require a project manager, a budget, um, and probably a year's worth of time to go in and help each development team migrate over to the new versions of the libraries. But with this automated enforcement, they were, they were able to start marking builds as unstable. They gave you know, four or five months notice to say, all right, at, at this point in time, you won't be able to deploy if you're using uh, those pipeline libraries. But they were able to provide the visibility along the way so developers were being warned um, about this, and they were able to migrate over themselves. So as we said, you know, back to federating the responsibility of, of compliance back to the developers. Um, it also gives you a, a path toward fully automated releases. So um, when you get to the point uh, where you can uh, be fully compliant with all the policies and procedures, you should be able to release without any human intervention. And that means uh, no change boards, uh, no manual risk review, uh, being able to go straight to production. Um, and so that's really what, what, uh, what the end goal is here for automated governance. And the outcomes being that you, your release cycle times go down, uh, compliance goes up, and most importantly, developer happiness and productivity increases as well. 
So that's what I have. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, uh, Andres is, is with Control Plane doing a lot of uh, consulting on this area and providing solutions. And then uh, we at Fianu are providing products in this space. So um, if any of this, you know, you found interesting or, or applicable to your company, please reach out to us and, and we'd be happy to talk. Thank you. So I think, I think we have some time, uh, but I'm happy to answer some questions if anyone has them. Yes. Yes. Right, so it's actually taking, in this example, it's actually taking the byte array, signing it, and then storing it in the database so that when you uh, pull that, that uh, the data from the database and you, uh, re and you marshal it back into a, a byte array, compare it against the signature, then you'll determine if it's, if it's matching. Uh, uh, that's yeah. That's the SIG store tool. It's an open source component uh, signing tool that that you can use. It's, uh, I, I believe it was developed uh, by by a lot of the folks at ChainGuard. ChainGuard. Sorry. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it.